Good morning, good day, good afternoon to everyone. We welcome you all to the fourth edition of the Transport and Climate Change Week and the Changing Transport Showtime. It's 3 p.m. right now in Berlin, and we're welcoming you to the afternoon session of the Changing Transport Showtime. Also, again, a good morning to our participants from Latin America. I'm uh, Nadja Tega. I'm a junior advisor at the GIZ, working on transport and climate change. And with me today is my colleague, Ernesto Feilbogen. He's a project manager for urban mobility and energy. And we will guide you through the Changing Transport Showtime. We will uh, see you three times this week, from Tuesday to Thursday, in the morning in, and in the afternoon, to accommodate for the different time regions that we have. We, ha we have participants here in the Transport and Climate Change Week 2021 from all over the world. And with this uh, hybrid format, we try to uh, have you all on board. And, um, Maybe we should dive into the background of the Transport Week and explain a little bit what it is about that we are doing here. Okay, good afternoon, Nadia, and good afternoon all the friends that accompany us coming from different countries in the region. We are starting the 3 p.m. transmission of the showtime, and being 3 p.m. in Berlin, we must say it is 7, 8 in some countries in Latin America. We hope many friends from Latin America join this session, and I must say, Una cordial bienvenidas a todos y todas y que disfruten ustedes del evento. Let's say that I am honored and very proud to be part of the team that is supporting this very interesting event. But let us go to a formal presentation first. The Transport and Climate Change Week is organized by the Deutsche Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit on behalf of the Federal Ministry of the Environment, Nature, Conservation and Nuclear Safety, BMU, but is financed by the International Climate Initiative, that is the ICI Initiative. This is the fourth edition and we'll have kind of virtual or hybrid style because we have limited face-to-face -face contact or session. And we will be running in five days. It is the second day we start yesterday with the conference day. We are working in close to 20, 20 hubs that represent the same number of countries and we are covering 13 time zones all over the world. We can say that the event is 100% green, uh, greenhouse gases offset. At certain time we will be working all together, but of course there are some specific events for the European region, Latin America, Africa and Asia. Great, thank you, Ernesto. We also want to tell you about the way we structured the Transport and Climate Change Week. So we dedicate the Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday to the Avoid, Shift, Improve approach. Um, maybe we can go one slide back. Yeah, thank you very much. There you see that we are dedicating today, Tuesday, to avoiding unnecessary motorized travel. So we want to encourage you to think about how you're contributing to transport to, or with your behavior to maybe reducing a motorized travel, maybe changing to active mobility. Because we in GIZ, we want to focus on the demand side approach. We don't want to only look at road infrastructure and expanding that, but look at um, what's, uh, what the role uh, transport demand place. So today we dedicate the day to avoid. Tomorrow we'll dedicate the day to shifting to low carbon modes of transport. So maybe how can we shift from everybody using their own private vehicle to maybe using public transport for example. And on uh, Thursday, on the 24th of June, we will look at how to improve the efficiency of transport, uh, the system as a whole, and maybe also of vehicles and fuels. So those are the guiding questions that uh, lead us through the day. And um, yeah, we want to encourage you to think about that also uh, from an individual perspective. Thank you. And now we look at the showtime. Yes, this showtime is organized every morning and every afternoon starting the session that are broadcasting from Berlin. We will receive country presentation in very short but very interesting video, five minutes approximately each. Also, report from organizations and private company that will tell news what are they doing all over the world. But we will have as well debates, quiz, polls, and of course, we will have a time to hear you. We want you to participate, to share with us your opinion, your comments. Don't feel 
Fred, you can use the chat uh, tool that is in the platform, and please let us know what you think, what is going on. You can comment us. Of course, we have a time where we will take a look what happened the day uh, before the, this session, and we will take a look at the current day agenda. Of course, this is a challenge. We are now working in a virtual environment, so we are facing a lot of new challenge. From our side, we need to coordinate what? Present discussion, not much of them, but virtual discussion with panelists that are not seated here. We have some interconnection problem. Video sometimes were good or bad. We are sorry if there is some problem, but we are doing our best. And we can imagine from your side that, that happened the same. We are doing home office and we need to interrupt. We need a break. The internet, the internet is not working properly. Well, let it take let's take it easy. We are trying to solve all the problem. We will solve all the problem and try try to think that we need to recognize and reward the effort and the enthusiasm to be working all together. This will be a very friendly event. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, Ernesto, for this reminder. So in case you missed uh, the, this morning's showtime, the Changing Transport Showtime of this morning, of the Berlin Time morning, you will find all the country presentations, all those videos that the participating countries submitted that present their transport sector and their actions. You will find them on our platform. And uh, I have the pleasure to introduce you now to my colleague, Julia. We will talk to Julia Remas. She will lead us uh, through all the features that the the platform has because we don't only have the Mobility Movies Theatre where you find uh, the country presentations among other videos, but many more. Let's hear from Julia what we can see on the platform. Hello everybody. Um, you might know me as the GIZ facilitator from yesterday and today. Because of Corona they told me that. And um, yeah, welcome to the platform called PLUS. I will show you around a little bit and um, highlight some of the features that we welcome you to use. And we will start with our partners without whom this event would not be possible. You can find them here on the left side of the menu bar and um, explore a little bit who is really behind all of this. And um, the next feature I would like to show you is this coffee lounge where my colleague Valerie Katagin and I welcome you four times a day from today until Thursday for some check-ins and um, workshop related coffee rooms and so on where you can really do a face-to-face -face interaction that comes as close as, as possible to a real conference. Um, so you can find them here in this little agenda also for Latin America, there are some coffee rooms. And then we have the wall of ideas where you can really get social, as you can see many of the participants have already shared their thoughts and ideas and some materials on uh, sustainable transport. So here you can comment, like and share and really um, react very well to each other. Then we have the mobility movie section where we will be uploading the wonderful country presentations from our showtimes from the different um, country hubs and what they're doing. As you can see, maybe <laughs> our chat is going crazy because we are working overtime to make this all happen. Uh, it's super exciting. Then we have um, the live stream, of course. Um, so we have um, this little arrow that you can pull out to see the chat interact with everybody, also post your questions who will then be forwarded to the stage and um, read live. This is a really special one, I think. Um, we have the polls where you can give us, for example, your feedback. You can see that it is open here from this blue um, uh, text. And then uh, we would really love to hear your feedback throughout the whole week. And then last but not least here, you can get back to the wall of ideas. And uh, those are the most important parts of the platform. Enjoy the rest of the program. Thank you very, very much, Julia. That is a perfect transition to our next point of the agenda, which is the polls, actually. So as Julia just showed you, there is the function of interacting with us 
through answering our polls. So we came up with the daily poll, or the poll of the day, where we ask you a question in the beginning of the Changing Transport Showtime, you have the whole hour time to answer it, and uh, we, uh, we come back to the results at the end of the showtime. Here you can see um, how it works. You just showed it right next to the live stream. You find a, a tab that says polls. You click on it, you will see changing transport written on a button. If you click on that, we'll, there the question appears. In a second, you will see what question that is. And um, you will be able to, to answer it throughout uh, this showtime. The question will be, oh, we want to ask you, we, would, we are interested in what mode you use, what transport mode did you use to get to work or to get wherever you were uh, watching us from today. It's an easy question. We don't want to make the start too tough on you. So uh, yeah, let us know, share with us. Um, Ernest and I, we walked together, or well, we walked this morning from the hotel to the studio, but maybe for you it's a bit different. And now now we come uh, to our next guest of the Changing Transport Showtime. We have with us today uh, Mr. Daniel Bongard. He's the program director of Transport and Power to X and the mastermind, basically, behind uh, this whole event. So it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Mr. Bongard to the stage. Thank you, Nadia, for welcoming me. <laughs> and uh, thank you for the intro to the Showtime. Of course. We are very excited to have you here. You have uh, already been here, of course, yesterday in the conference day. We had a day full, packed uh, with events. Um, maybe we can get uh, the graphic recording here on our screen because we yesterday illustrated everything that happened. The day was mm -hmm. packed um, with a graphic recording. Uh, you can see that here behind us. Um, you see so many participating countries, uh, so many things going on. Do you have any highlight? Like when you look at this, what comes to mind? Yeah, I think this was uh, really done during the World Coffee session. And uh, so in the morning, we traveled around Asia and then came to uh, Eastern Europe, Africa, and ended up in the afternoon in Latin America. And I think it was really impressive to see the different kind of people participating in Transport Week, the different uh, countries that are around with different challenges. That was really fascinating. And people mainly talked about uh, yeah, the climate crisis and how to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And then secondly, they talked about the COVID crisis and how this affected their work. And then last but not least, also digitalization is one of the topics of the conference. So that was mentioned frequently, how data uh, and use of data is tackling the work. Mm -hmm. That's true, that was very, very interesting. But we didn't only have the World Cafe. Do we also, I mean, we are looking at the world map here. We see it's full of our countries, of course, our partnering countries are all over the world. But we did have some German companies here, I think, right? Yeah, yesterday, of course, we <coughs> showed to some of the partners, uh, really, what is going on in Germany. So GIZ is a German organization, the Federal Ministry of Environment, that is kindly sponsoring this event as a German ministry. So I think many have been interested in it. And we started the day with a keynote presentation from, uh, um, from uh, Dirk Messner, who is uh, the president of the Federal Environmental Agency, and he gave lots of insights. We had a, a message from the German Minister of Environment on why transport is so important. And uh, we had another uh, e, um, event where we were looking at the German railway company and how they are tackling freight emissions and to shift uh, goods from uh, road to, uh, to rail. Yeah, so that was quite interesting. And last but not least, we launched this uh, brochure uh, so that was uh, that is telling the story of the transport transformation in Germany in a different way. It's a comic, and uh, so go to the website and look at it. I think that's really nice uh, communication material. Thank you, Dania, very much for the recap of yesterday. So so many interesting uh, things to see there. We want to uh, continue now, though, with the country presentations, with the, our first country presentations from Latin America. Uh, the honor goes to Mexico. Mexico will open the country presentation slot in the Changing Transport Showtime today. And um, yeah, I wish you lots of fun enjoying the video from Mexico.
El transporte de carga y el transporte público juegan un papel crucial para reducir las emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero en México, ya que el sector transporte provoca alrededor de un cuarto de estas emisiones en el país. Además, la mitad de la población realiza sus viajes en transporte público. En GIZ apoyamos la implementación de medidas para reducir las emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero y contaminantes atmosféricos del transporte de carga. Por ejemplo, trabajamos con ciudades en la ubicación y gestión de bahías de carga y descarga para hacer la distribución de mercancías en la última milla más eficiente. Asimismo, fomentamos el desarrollo de una aplicación facilitando así una gestión digital de las bahías. Además, con el fin de promover la profesionalización de las empresas, desarrollamos un portal digital que concentra en un solo lugar la información sobre las capacitaciones disponibles. A través de este portal, empresas transportistas identifican la capacitación más adecuada a sus necesidades y, junto con organizaciones internacionales como el Smart Freight Center, completamos la oferta con cursos sobre el uso de tecnologías eficientes y la gestión de flotas. En GIZ promovemos una planeación de movilidad integral con el fin de alcanzar modos de transporte de bajas emisiones y asegurar un acceso universal a los sistemas de transporte. Introducimos tecnologías digitales que permiten la recolección y el procesamiento de datos para mejorar la toma de decisiones en la planeación y operación del transporte. Además, impulsamos la introducción de autobuses eléctricos. Pensar que vamos a tener un transporte público seguro, cómodo, que nos va a poder conectar con el resto de la ciudad, pero sobre todo que es un transporte público que no contamina, que el día de mañana, cuando yo esté aquí en mi colonia, respire aire limpio sin miedo a enfermarme. La Ciudad de México adquirió 193 unidades de trolebuses de nueva generación lo que permitió la habilitación y recuperación de corredores de transporte con estas unidades, así como una reducción del 68% de emisiones con relación con lo que se generaría con unidades de diésel. Es un vehículo eléctrico, es un vehículo limpio, un vehículo que contribuye a tener un ambiente y calidad del aire mucho más limpio. La participación de los autobuses eléctricos o cero emisiones en el cambio climático es fundamental. Las calles completas buscan incorporar modos de transporte bajos en emisiones en el mismo espacio, dando prioridad a peatones y ciclistas. En GIZ brindamos asesoría técnica a diferentes niveles de gobierno para diseñar calles completas y espacios públicos inclusivos que integren elementos de infraestructura verde. Entonces el gran reto es conectar la ciudad en movilidad. En una ciclovía hay un plan maestro de más de 60 kilómetros. Hoy ya tenemos funcionando un, la primera etapa que es de 21 kilómetros que conecta eh, prácticamente desde zonas muy urbanas, centros comerciales la universidad, que para nosotros es muy importante, y conecta con la línea 2 del metro. Esto permitiría una movilidad para poder eh, transportarse de una forma saludable, segura, porque es con carril confinado lo que es la ciclovía, y eh, muy importante, bajar las emisiones de CO2. En San Nicolás de los Garza se implementó la ciclovía emergente Las Puentes, de 21 kilómetros, la cual beneficia a una población aproximada de 15.000 personas. That was the video from Mexico. I must say I was very impressed. It seems like a very comprehensive approach, this mixture of like green infrastructure and uh, active mobility. And also, I really like that there were so many freight me measures in there, considering that freight makes up around 40% of emissions from transport. And we only see it's in about freight measures in only about 20% of the new and updated uh, climate plans that uh, countries are submitting under the Paris Agreement. So, Mexico really impressed me there. Um, what, what do we have next, Ernesto? 
please don't move. Now that we are in Mexico, we will continue in Mexico. Okay. The next video is of a very nice city in Mexico that is called Merida, and we'll see a video from Anda Merida, very interesting initiative. Please share with us the video. There seems to be. There seems to be a mistake, no problem. Um, we will check if we can find the video from Mexico, otherwise we will just move to another region of Latin America that I'm sure has many, many interesting things to share about transport, which is Ecuador. Maybe give us a second. Um, Ernesto, but do you know Anda Merida? Have you worked with them before? Have you heard from I've them? I've been in Merida before. Ah, that is lucky a you. wonderful city that I can recommend everybody that goes to Mexico. And the initiative in Anda, in Anda Merida was related to create more spaces in the, in the open space, with so public space. They need to find a way to share. Everybody that uses public spaces has a right to use in the way they are using, pedestrians, cyclists, also car, of course. And they need, they are trying to look the way to share these public spaces. And what was very very interesting is the way they behave in order to create the space. They create very painful, colorful areas, and also they put some artworks, some painting in the walls. So the city or the area where the intervention was developed was now very colorful, and people are really excited with this uh, change. But if the video of Merida is coming later, we can jump to Ecuador. Yes. We, we can see what we can continue. Yes, let's take a look at the video from Ecuador. Let's see what the transport sector has uh, done there. And the Merida. El espacio público es todo el espacio pues que justamente se encuentra en una ciudad que no es propiedad privada y que es el espacio al que tenemos o deberíamos tener acceso todas las personas. Comienza desde el momento en el que abres la puerta de tu casa, la que da a la calle. Es un lugar donde estás fuera de casa, pero a la vez estás en casa con otros, ¿no? Con quienes viven también en la ciudad. Anda Mérida busca cambiar formas de conducta en el espacio público. Buscamos priorizar la seguridad y el uso del espacio público para los peatones y ciclistas. Ahora el reto es aprender a convivir todos en el espacio público y poder encontrarnos todos en, el, en ese mismo espacio de una manera armoniosa. A nosotros como peatones nos beneficia por la seguridad de nosotras o de nosotros, pero para los automovilistas pues les reducen el espacio. Tenemos opiniones diferentes de acuerdo a, lo, a nuestras necesidades. Todos somos peatones en algún momento de nuestros traslados de un lugar a otro. En algún momento todos nos bajamos de nuestro vehículo y caminamos. Los habitantes de San Sebastián y de la ermita también quieren ser vistos. Esto también es un proyecto que pone a la comunidad en el centro de la atención de la ciudad. Lo que no se ve es todo el trabajo de colaboración inmensa que los diferentes grupos que me han antecedido y muchos más han contribuido para que esto ocurra. Desde la iniciativa del colectivo Tomate y el apoyo de la GIZ, con las guías de Sedatu. Y yo quiero también aquí reconocer la participación de diferentes dependencias públicas de, de la localidad, tanto el INA, la Secretaría de Seguridad Pública, la Dirección de la Policía Municipal, la Dirección del Desarrollo Urbano, la Oficina de Gestión del Centro Histórico. Muy importante la promoción y apoyo del Patronato del Centro Histórico de Mérida y de la agrupación de diferentes unidades de vecinos de la comunidad que también han estado interesados. Lo más difícil es mover las voluntades. Y este proyecto va en el camino exactamente de eso, de transformar la ciudad en beneficio de las personas y además poniéndole un toque de color, alegría, disfrute, orgullo de ser parte del proyecto. Consideren que esto es solamente el inicio de un proceso más de transformación positiva de la ciudad 
a favor de las personas. Al final del día, cuando nosotros nos vamos, cuando la intervención se termina, estos proyectos se quedan en la comunidad y es importante que haya esta apropiación, no solamente para que puedan tener un efecto muy positivo, que en el caso de Mérida estamos seguros que así será y que en el corto y en el mediano plazo habrá grandes resultados, pero sobre todo a largo plazo, porque estamos convencidos que es un parteaguas y que habrá un cambio muy, muy importante. El arte es también nuestro medio, es nuestro encuentro, es esta forma de comunicarnos y de entablar una conversación con los vecinos y con las vecinas de este espacio. Cuando las muchachas vinieron a, a platicar con nosotros con respecto a lo que se le iba a pintar al, al muro, fue más interesante porque nos preguntaron sobre las costumbres y lo que habíamos vivido. Esto es Sando Mérida, acompáñenos a conocerlo. Como con algunas líneas en el piso y algunas indicaciones, cambia el flujo de una dinámica cotidiana para, para bien, ¿no? para sumar al día a día del peatón, del, del transeúnte, eso es, eso es increíble. Como te digo, que está reflejada la vida de, pues de nosotros, como familia. La gente que me pregunta, les explico y me siento muy orgullosa y me gustó mucho el trabajo que ustedes hicieron, la verdad, me encantó. I already mentioned they put some colors in the street and not only in the street, also in the wall. And I must confess, it seems that car drivers feel more comfortable now in those streets. Let's go now, if it's possible, to the video from Ecuador, please, because we need to continue with the schedule. Nacional y Ministerio de Transporte y Obras Públicas impulsamos soluciones ambientalmente sostenibles en torno al transporte terrestre en todas sus modalidades. En este contexto trabajamos en la construcción de la Estrategia Nacional de Electromovilidad del Ecuador instrumento para guiar y aplicar la movilidad eléctrica y el uso de energías renovables. Hoy compartimos este programa que permitirá reducir los contaminantes, el consumo de combustibles y como consecuencia el ahorro de 7.243 millones de dólares durante su aplicación en el periodo 2020-2040. Declarado por la UNESCO como primer patrimonio cultural de la humanidad, es la capital del Ecuador y pronto contará con su primera línea de metro. Gran parte de sus casi 3 millones de habitantes se movilizan a diario en vehículos a combustión, generando el 52% de emisiones de CO2 y más de 5.7 millones de toneladas de dióxido de carbono por año. El subsistema Metro de Quito utilizará energía 100% eléctrica, limpia y renovable. Cuenta con un sistema propio de alimentación y reutilización de electricidad que se produce con el frenado de cada tren. La electricidad que utiliza procederá de los afluentes de la ciudad, logrando así impulsar una economía circular. El metro favorecerá la calidad de vida de toda la ciudadanía y fomentará el desarrollo ecológico, económico y social con proyección a futuro. El 
tranvía de Cuenca es un medio de transporte seguro, eficaz y 100% amigable con el medio ambiente. Que todos queremos, usa un sistema completamente eléctrico, libre de combustibles y gases de efecto invernadero. Con su uso, construimos juntos una ciudad más armónica y con menos tráfico debido a que es ligero, silencioso y ocupa 30 veces menos espacio que el automóvil. Un sistema de transporte pensado en el bienestar y comodidad de los ciudadanos. Es asequible, inclusivo, cómodo. Las personas pueden ingresar en sillas de ruedas, coches de bebé. Las paradas tienen facilidad para adquirir sus tarjetas. Tenemos sistema braille, auditivo. Personas con discapacidad visual pueden acceder. Además, al ser un medio innovador ubicado en Cuenca entre las ciudades más modernas del país y Latinoamérica. Hace un año, la COVID-19 fue declarada pandemia, llevando al mundo entero a confinarse. Y Ambato no fue la excepción. La pandemia evidenció los fuertes problemas de movilidad de la ciudad, ya que, por las restricciones emitidas, los ciudadanos dejaron de lado los autos y optaron por el uso de bicicletas o la caminata, pese a que no existían áreas exclusivas para el efecto. La Municipalidad de Ambato, liderada por el doctor Javier Altamirano Sánchez, tomó este problema y decidió convertirlo en una oportunidad. Y con el apoyo de Euroclima Plus y la cooperación técnica alemana GIZ, se elaboró un plan emergente de movilidad, implementando un plan piloto con los primeros carriles exclusivos para bicicletas y peatones. Además, se implementará un circuito ciclístico de 12 kilómetros en el corto plazo, 22 kilómetros a mediano plazo y 51 kilómetros a largo plazo. Completando un total de 85 kilómetros de rutas ciclísticas con infraestructura innovadora e incluyente. Así, juntos estamos construyendo para hacer de Ambato la gran ciudad del Ecuador. So finally, there we had the country presentation from Ecuador, and I am personally very, very glad that we didn't miss out on that, because I found it very, very interesting uh, to see this variety of measures. They had those uh, cities, they had uh, Cuenca with the tramway, um, and mentioned that uh, it saves 30 times the space uh, that they uh, used before for, for private transport. So uh, also those three million passengers that they are transporting in Quito with this new 100% uh, renewable energy based uh, metro system are very, very impressive numbers. And then in Ambato, those very, very beautiful active mobility walking spaces um, make me really want to go there and check out those transport systems. Um, our next contribution will come from the International Council on Clean Transportation. They will talk about the true initiative among others. Poor air quality is so very detrimental to our health and vehicles on our roads contribute to that poor air quality. But our regulations are set on the basis of the readings, the measurements of what those cars are emitting in laboratories. And one of the key things that's emerged is the big gap that exists between what people believe our vehicles are doing in terms of the emissions they're creating and what they're actually doing. One of the big gaps when it comes to emissions is due to cheating on the tests. So FEAR Foundation is supporting an initiative called the Real Urban Emissions Initiative, which is explicitly testing vehicles on the road in order to see what that gap is and to frame regulation, consumer choices, manufacturing processes that close it. The True Initiative has spent some time developing a rating system which looks at the real-world emissions of the vehicles on our roads and classifies them, good, moderate and poor, as to how far in excess they are of the required limits for vehicles. There is a growing interest among cities around the world to use real-world emissions to inform their public, to inform their citizens and to drive policy. And so cities can really learn from each other. Uh, and so cities more and more interested in taking actions that are having significant and immediate impacts. So what we want to see now is this expanding beyond our initial pilot cities of London and Paris and being taken to other parts of the world, particularly those cities and, and mega cities which are experiencing rapid motorization, um, high levels of emissions, appalling effects on child health and really begin to address 
policy in those places so that we can get the vehicle fleet right and also incentivise modal shift so that we encourage people to keep walking and cycling. Air quality is uh, practical problems that can be and should be addressed. In some cities, if the water was as dirty as the air that people and children are breathing, they simply wouldn't drink it. In an ideal world, cars and trucks would be 100% emission-free. Unfortunately, they aren't. The reality is that pollution from vehicles is frequently above legal limits. This impacts our climate and the health of millions of people, especially in urban areas. The need to act is urgent, yet laboratory tests by themselves to determine emission levels have proven inadequate. So we need new technologies and new policy approaches. And that's where remote sensing comes in. Remote sensing is proven technology that has evolved considerably in recent years. It gives researchers and policymakers insight into transportation's true contributions to air pollution. This can lead to more effective policies, because if you know the facts, you can act on them. So what exactly is remote sensing? Remote sensing measures exhaust emissions from vehicles in normal, everyday driving. The equipment can be set up above or alongside a roadway. Using a sensor and light beam, it measures pollutant concentrations in the exhaust plume as a vehicle passes. A camera records the license plate. This can be used to look up make, model and other specifications, such as fuel type and engine size. Another device measures speed and rate of acceleration. Meanwhile, sensors measure ambient conditions, such as temperature, barometric pressure and humidity. A remote sensing setup can record thousands of samples a day. That much data can provide a good picture of vehicle emissions at the location, including the concentrations of specific pollutants. And that's just the beginning. When you combine remote sensing measurements made at many different locations at different times of year, you can construct a very detailed and instructive picture of how and where pollution is occurring. For instance, you can gather data on the emissions of cars of brand X, Model Y, with a gasoline engine built in 2015. Are real-world emissions from these cars in line with laboratory limits? Is their emissions performance better or worse than similar vehicles made by other manufacturers? Valuable data. A good example of how valuable is London. Remote sensing data helped reveal that nitrogen oxide emissions from the iconic black taxis were seven times legal limits and far exceeded other diesel passenger cars. That's the kind of insight that can be useful to policymakers determined to improve air quality. Remote sensing isn't a silver bullet, but it is a practical and cost-effective technology. Combined with laboratory testing and other techniques, it can lead to a clearer understanding of air pollution from on-road transport and better policy options. It takes us closer to our goal, improve air quality in cities all around the world. Well, I think that video was a very, very good example of the other side of transport that we shouldn't forget. Uh, I remember a quote saying, if the water was as dirty as the air people are breathing, people wouldn't drink it. That shows us that we really need data. We need, uh, well, tools like remote sensing to make evidence-based policy decisions that go even beyond the benefits of, of course, protecting our climate. Um, and now we move to the next video. Ernesto, what is that? Now we need to move to Brazil because we are going to present the National Platform for Electric Mobility. Let's see what is this about in this initiative, please. There's well, the well, they are coming. The National Platform for Electromobility is a governance structure that fostered the development of sector in Brazil that was created in 2020 and brings together more than 30 institutions that will work in different areas of electric mobility to support the development in Brazil. 
Mm? What is very interesting is to hear the focus they put. This is a platform, and they say that the objective is very clear, improve and qualify the debate on electric mobility in order to propose concrete measures that will be aligned to the real needs in Brazil. Sounds Perhaps great. Let's watch it, right? Let's watch the video. That was the wrong video, uh, very obviously. Well, you got a little bit of a glimpse into uh, the country presentation of the Philippines. Uh, we showed that this morning, actually. So uh, it's on the platform already. If you go to the Mobility Movies Theater on the platform, you can see the whole video. Um, I don't know if we can see the... We will not uh, watch the video from Brazil right now. Instead, I think we have a, a speaker. Oh, we do have Brazil, I'm hearing that. Well, then let's try, give it another try, third time, maybe that one's the charm. Well, maybe, maybe that was not the charm. We will upload it, we, we, you will find it where you find all the other videos, that's no problem. Um, and now we want to talk to Bronwyn Thornton uh, from Walk21. Walk21 is, uh, is a community and NGO that is active in every continent. They bring together a broad variety of projects and I see that Bronwyn is already there. Um, hi Bronwyn, you're an international expert, facilitator and trainer in walking and walkable communities. You have more than 20 years of experience in strategic transport planning, community and political engagement. Very, very interesting. Um, maybe we can already start with the first question. I would really like to know what the key projects are that you support and that you uh, do to promote uh, people walking in Walk 21. Hello, and thank you so much for having us in this Showtime uh, session. We're really pleased to be supporting uh, Transport and Climate Change Week. Again, we were with you last year. In fact, I think it was our last event before lockdown uh, last year. So here at Walk 21, um, we've just celebrated our 21st conference and um, years of promoting and supporting working. And I just wanted to frame up for you a few key points, uh, starting from the global level and, and working all the way down to street level, which is uh, where we actually experience the impact of that work. So firstly, we do represent walking at the global stage with global agendas around climate climate, sustainable development goals, uh, road safety, particularly now with the second decade of action for road safety, recognizing the importance of mode shift um, to support uh, to walking as an act of improving road safety for everybody, which is very exciting. And also the physical activity needs, our health needs um, by having daily active mobility. We're also working at a national level, looking at data comparisons, putting a walking lens over existing databases and bringing together national pictures based on what is the demand for walking, the accessibility of that walking environment, the comfort that people experience, the safety or the road danger that they actually suffer from, and what's the policy context within which these things are happening. And we're developing that at the moment, so stay tuned for that. We've given people a little insight, and it's really quite insightful. Um, but what that needs is good governance underpinning those impacts on the ground. And that's where our Pathways to Walkable Cities, which supports good governance, recognizes the efforts that cities are making to deliver more walkable communities is the project. And bringing us right down to street level is our walkability app, which if I um, had had my background, you would have seen our new icons for that. We're running a pilot in Dublin with women uh, later this year, and it's going to be rolled out in other city centers as well. In addition to support these things, we run the annual conference. It will be next year in Ireland. It's a national conference supported by the national government to reflect the growing importance of walking on that agenda. And if you really want to stay engaged, sign up to the charter and our newsletter. Um, and we are chairing the Africa Network for walking and cycling to progress the agenda on that continent as well. 
So that's quite a long list in the end, actually. No wonder I'm feeling rather busy. But we do all of this in partnership with lots of really great people. That sounds indeed like a long list of things you're doing. You must be extremely busy. Well, uh, I wonder, you, we were naming so, so many interesting activities that you're doing. How can cities and communities actually get involved in Walk 21? Yeah, please. Um, we, we can only share the stories that we have, and we've been facilitating that sharing of stories since we began. So come to the conferences, join our Pathways project, tell us about the successes in your cities. If you'd like to help us pilot the app on the streets in your town, then you're very welcome to um, be in touch about that. Um, sign the newsletter, join the Africa Network, actually, and we will be launching Walk 21 Europe Uh, later this year, and perhaps this is the space where you can find um, to promote the cities, especially uh, my colleague Jim is talking at the Eastern European workshops this afternoon, and we're seeing some really great work happening over there. And tomorrow we have some one-on-one -on -one expert sessions, which we do with cities actually quite often. So if you've got some particular sticky issues that you'd like to talk to us about, whether it's a governance issue, a training issue, or an on-street uh, concern, then we're very happy to provide that expert input to the to the work that you're doing. Thank you very much. Your answer now can lead me to a second question, if I can interrupt you for a moment. How can cities and communities get involved in the activities of Walk 21? Yeah, so actually I'd like to highlight that, in fact, the... the um, The video that you showed had the mayor of Mbato there, and he, at the GIZ meeting last year, he signed the International Charter for Walking. There and then on the spot, we had to run around and get a printout. Um, and it's lovely to see that translated into action on the street. So you're very welcome to visit walk21.com and, and to sign the charter. Um, take it to your agencies, take it to your organizations. It's for individuals as well as for agencies to make those commitments and start to explore the issues, actions, and ideas that that are in there to help you deliver um, for more walkable streets in your town. We also would be very happy if you want to engage with us on the data project. You can bring national data to our, to our platform, or if you are working at a city level, bring your success stories to us, share them through our newsletter and our Pathways to Walkable Cities project. We do run as a network, so we rely not only on ourselves and the people working with us, but the communities and activists and advocates that are everywhere seeking to make walking um, better for everybody. I, I think in that true present videos that we just saw, how appalling the conditions are for people in many, many places. And uh, it's an essential part of the climate agenda. So if you have a city like that, or if you have a lovely European city which could host more walking, we can support whether it's necessity or walking by choice. A great plan. Uh, thank you very, very much, Bronwyn, for uh, being here with us today in the Changing Transport Showtime. We appreciate uh, your participation and want to highlight once more that um, you will be available tomorrow in the expert clinics. Um, so thank you very, very much. Um, thank we you can, for having me. Yeah, thank you. We can uh, now come actually to the Brazil video. Let's try once more. Maybe you're lucky this time. A mobilidade elétrica é essencial para que o Brasil se desenvolva nos aspectos ambiental, social, econômico e tecnológico. Muitas instituições já atuam para promover a mobilidade elétrica no Brasil. E uma estrutura que explore as sinergias entre suas iniciativas contribui para termos uma mobilidade elétrica alinhada com o desenvolvimento sustentável. Esses esforços foram reunidos, em 2020, na Plataforma Nacional de Mobilidade Elétrica, a PNME. Somos mais de 30 instituições da indústria, do governo, da sociedade civil e da academia e trabalhamos para qualificar o debate sobre a mobilidade elétrica e propor soluções concretas alinhadas com as reais necessidades do nosso país. Grandes recompensas exigem a superação de grandes desafios em um trabalho conjunto e coordenado. Na PNME, reunimos esforços para que isso aconteça. That was worth to wait for the video. Very nice video, and we need to remark, qualify and improve the debate. This is the main objective of this platform. Now, we will move to another country input, and it is time to talk about 
Guatemala. Please share the video of Guatemala. La tendencia actual en el sector transporte es migrar hacia la movilidad eléctrica para la reducción de emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero, dado que el sector transporte ocupa el segundo lugar en cuanto a la generación de emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero en nuestro país. De ahí la importancia de promover acciones para contribuir en su reducción. Para Guatemala, el apoyo a la cooperación internacional es vital para cumplir con sus compromisos nacionales e internacionales en cuanto a la reducción de emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero de un 22.5%, como está expresado en la contribución nacionalmente determinada, y también poder cumplir con la Agenda 2020-2030. Euroclima como ente de cooperación internacional y GIZ como administradora de los fondos ha jugado un papel muy importante en la implementación de diversos proyectos en el país. El proyecto surge gracias a que Euroclima Cruz lanza el concurso a nivel internacional y como Alapa viendo de que los vehículos tuk eh, de combustión hay muchos antiguos que emiten mucho, mucho humo y que esto eh, repercute en la contaminación ambiental de nuestro municipio. La iniciativa de implementar un proyecto de movilidad eléctrica en el municipio de San Juan Comalapa, en el departamento de Chimaltenango, se debe a que un alto porcentaje de personas utilizan el servicio público de triciclos accionados por motor de combustión interna, trasladando aproximadamente a 6.700 pasajeros diariamente. Se considera que una vez que se logre la adaptabilidad de los vehículos a las condiciones topográficas y urbanísticas del municipio, pueda iniciarse un proceso de transición de la movilidad por combustibles fósiles a movilidad eléctrica, reduciendo no solo la contaminación, sino también los costos de operación, lo que se contribuirá en un factor de replicabilidad para otros municipios del país. Todo lo anterior con el objetivo de alcanzar las metas propuestas por el país en su contribución nacionalmente determinada NDC ante la Convención Marco de las Naciones Unidas sobre el Cambio Climático. That was a very nice picture of Guatemala, and particularly San Juan Comalapa, in the department of Chimaltenango. I must confess the music was also very nice. I heard that it's one local compositor. And this is a starting point. They are showing us the intention to replace traditional tuk-tuks, rickshaw, that are more than 200 running in San uh, Juan Comalapa for E. Tuk -tuks. So the idea will be for them to try this new technology, technology to show, to prove that it is as useful as the traditional one, 
but cheaper and more friendly with the, uh, with the climate, yes? And um, we will do this mission this year, and perhaps we'll get results to share in the next Transport and Climate Change Week. And then we finish all the country contributions. Yes. That's correct. Let's take a look at the poll now. Remember, uh, we started our poll of the day this morning in the beginning of the showtime and asked you about uh, what transport mode you use to get to work. And uh, we see here that cycling is definitely dominating. Uh, we see cycling uh, very different to, this, uh, to the first showtime that we had today, followed by public transport. What do you say to this, Ernesto? I am comparing this result with the one we got this morning. It's incredible. The morning was public transport and walking a little bit, cycling, but now cycling have a very increased increase attendance here in this audience at least. Very, very interesting. Well, let's look at what follows the show time, because of course your day uh, to the to Latin American participants is only starting. Uh, I hope you have uh, enjoyed the show time so far. Maybe uh, drank a coffee coffee in between. Um, and here you see on the agenda what follows. So we have the uh, workshop. We have a workshop now, where we have an esteemed colleague who will uh, join us on the stage in a second, and that will be followed from the global program by the hydrogen hour that is taking a look at why do we actually need power to act in transport. The daily hydrogen hour uh, will look at opportunities about uh, power to act and um, we will have high-level experts give key insights uh, on power to x production, the processes, applications, everything around it. So the hydrogen hour that takes place every day will uh, focus on different uh, angles of power to x But now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. André Fitzler. Uh, who is uh, organizing and holding the next workshop, actually. Hi, André. You, are working, uh, you will work on transport demand management and sustainable urban mobility planning in a digital age. Tell us more about that. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nadia. I'm not going to repeat it because it's a very difficult uh, <laughs> <True>. <laughs> combination of words. Um, Yes, so it's a super exciting session where we have very different uh, speaker profiles and, and, and presentations. Um, on the one hand, we're going to have the cities presenting their best practice in, in uh, managing the demand, managing the urban transport uh, through innovative solutions. On the one hand, we are going to have uh, private sector presenting their ideas, their um, solutions, how they can help the cities to do it. And then we have uh, uh, an outside view from the finance sector, from Professor Dick Heinrichs from KFW, who is going to, to give his opinion. Super exciting, great people. Please join. Make sure you join. Sounds definitely very, very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, and with that, Ernesto. We are finishing our show time, but show must go on, and transport and climate change, we continue. We have this Latin American session that have many things to offer to us, and we are here about the next workshop. So many thanks for being with us this hour in the afternoon session of the show time, and we will see each other more, tomorrow morning in the morning, 8 o'clock in Berlin time, or in the afternoon, 3 p.m. in Berlin time as well. Many thanks. Thank you.